So today, I'm honored to welcome Chris Mitchell, a veteran journalist and Middle East Bureau Chief for CBN News. You know, he spent over 20 years reporting from Jerusalem with a focus on God's work in the region. I'm so honored that you're here. Chris, you know, you're in the Middle East. You've been in Jerusalem. You've been in Israel. And that's my love. I love hearing all about it. I love hearing about the people and what they're going through. Um, when did you first sense that God was leading you to report on the Middle East? Well, I think it goes back to 1996, Nancy, and that was the first time I came here to Israel. It was on a CBN assignment. I came with a, a close colleague of mine, uh, John Wagi, and we came here to do a series of stories uh, for the 700 Club. Uh, they were going to come here and they were going to be on location. And for each one of those, they wanted a, a news story. So I came here. My first impression was I fell in love with the land, fell in love with the people. Uh, I felt like the Lord was a proud landowner showing mm -hmm. me his land because this is it's the promised land, but it's his land. And uh, my one regret at the time, Nancy, was that I, my wife, Liz, and our three children, Philip, Kathleen, and Grace, weren't with me. Because if you're here, you can tell stories, show pictures or videos, but it's nothing like actually being here. And so, but then uh, as, as, as the Lord would have it, four years later, we all came uh, in 2000. In the meantime, there were a couple of experiences that I felt really uh, helped solidify coming here. My boss, I believe in 1998, put out an email asking for volunteers to start a bureau. And uh, when I got that um, email, I literally pushed myself away from the computer screen uh, it was a big computer at the time, back in 1998, wasn't these flat screens that we have now. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, uh, I really felt it was, uh, you know, a sacred, holy calling that you don't enter into uh, cavalierly or without knowing that you're really supposed to do that. Uh, and back up one year later, I was here on another assignment. I went to a uh, message by a well-known Bible teacher named Derek Prince. And... Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, he, uh, he related a story back that in 1948, he was getting discharged from the British Army, and he told an elderly Jewish woman that he wanted to live in Jerusalem. And, uh, well, the lady said to him, Derek, you don't choose Jerusalem. Jerusalem chooses you. Uh -huh. But he said that, it pierced my heart, and I thought, Lord, are you calling us to Jerusalem? So when I got that email asking for volunteers, uh, my wife, Liz, and I, we prayed, we fasted about it, and there were many confirmations that we felt this was the calling he had for it, for our lives. We thought we would come in 1998, but we, in 2000, in May of 2000, then president of uh, CBN at the time, Michael Little, uh, on the third floor of the studio, studio headquarters building, put his hand on my shoulder and he said, get ready to go to Jerusalem. So we wow. here in August of 2000, what's called the second intifada began the next month there was a period of maybe three and a half to four years of suicide bombings terror attacks and uh but through that time uh the lord protected us uh like it says in psalm 91 that he that dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty and we felt like god would not only protect us my wife and i but he would protect our three children and he did and so how did your family handle this, the whole move and a culture change? And I mean, this was God's plan for you, but how did that all go? Well, it wasn't easy. Um, uh, my wife, Liz, uh, admits that it was very difficult for her at first. She got, it was, uh, she went, fell into depression. Uh, you have to realize it is a new country. It's a new language. It's a new culture. And it's a new intifada. It's literally things that are blowing up uh, near home, school, and work. But she was a, just a trooper to uh, forge through that. And, uh, and then my children uh, also had their own different experiences. I say, my son Philip didn't want to come to Israel. And we told him that, let him finish his junior year in, in Israel. But if he wants to complete his senior year in the States, we had a family that was willing to host him and uh, for his senior year in high school. But after about three weeks, he decided because of the 
friends that he had made, the experiences he was having. He was going to stay junior and senior year. Uh, my daughter Kathleen probably acclimated the quickest of our children. Uh, she made some very close friends and did well. I think uh, Grace, our youngest, was eight at the time, and uh, she kept asking me at the beginning, Daddy, when we're we going home? And, uh, it was kind of heartbreaking because I said, well, Grace, we're home. And uh, I remember a, uh, during the very beginning of the Intifada, I remember I was up uh, praying with her in, uh, before she went to sleep while watching helicopter gunships on their way to uh, Bethlehem. And uh, so it was very kind of a picture of what we were experiencing. Uh, but she made it through as well. We all did. And uh, it was, as my daughter Kathleen says, it really ruined them for the ordinary. Uh, they became what some people call third culture kids. They kind of didn't fit into U.S. culture anymore, and they weren't quite fully integrated into Israeli culture, but they, they had a mix of it. So, but they made very, very close uh, sometimes lifelong friends, and it really, uh, I guess you could say, expanded their horizons. Mm -hmm. Do they have a love for Israel like you? Uh, they have a love for Israel. I, I think they're all back in the States right now. Uh, uh -huh. So they, um, they all love Israel, um, but I, I think maybe, um, I guess I feel like the Lord's called me here, uh, right. you know, for a special reason and mm -hmm. uh time absolutely now so what does your wife do now you're you're doing all this reporting you're out there in the mission field what is she doing on her end well uh, she's been uh, you know at the very beginning she was a mother and taking care of our kids uh taking care of me uh you know when we helped uh, raise our kids and then right now she spends a, more time back in the states because you know we've grown as a family so now we have grandchildren and uh, as a grandmother, she really likes to stay close to them. Uh, they're, some are in, uh, both, all of them are in Virginia. And so uh, she spent some time there. And, uh, and it's been a little difficult since the war began uh, for her to be here. So it's, uh, right now we're in a season where it's, she's there a little more than, than I am. And that's her mission field, her grandchildren right now, right, for helping? You, you are correct. You, uh, yep. Uh, any grandmother would understand that. Absolutely, because I got three. I actually have four, so I know how that feels. I, yep. I understand that. Yep. And um, and it's so nice that, you know, you're both understanding on both ways that, that this can work out with you, you know. So, you know, you bring such a great mix of journalism and, and faith to your reporting. How do you stay true to both while covering such big issues? Well, that's a great question. I guess you try to be uh, just clear-headed about how you report on uh, what's happening and it's easy uh i guess working at cbn makes a, a huge difference because as a ministry you know we see things through a biblical lens mm -hmm. and so you know the reporting especially here in israel uh reflects that so yeah. when you're talking about um wars and rumors of wars you know from a biblical perspective that's what jesus said would happen one day uh mm -hmm. you know when we see october 7th we we see that as such a horrible uh, event but also you know maybe one of the birth pangs that jesus talked about mm -hmm. uh, when we see biblical uh, um, developments like the jewish the return of the jewish people to the land of israel yeah, mm -hmm. you know, we can, we see that and we can report that, uh, you know, from a biblical lens. And mm -hmm. so it's it's really a, a wonderful marriage to be able to share um, the news of what's happening here. It's not only just news, but it's really uh, we're seeing prof prophecy unfolding yeah. here in, yeah. uh, in the Middle East, in Jerusalem, uh, the nations of the earth coming against this city. Um, mm -hmm. So, and we encourage people to pray, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's um, something we do often on our programs, Jerusalem Dateline, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, ask, encourage people to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a marriage made in heaven, I guess, when you can, uh, you have both the opportunity to report on what's happening, but also see it through a biblical lens. 
Yeah, the Jewish people must be so such a beautiful uh, people that they they have such a love for their own land. They have a love for one another. And I don't know if a lot of people really know what they're like. What, what, if you were going to explain to someone what a what a, a typical Jewish lifestyle or person is, what what would you say? Well, it's a great question. Uh, there's such a d diversity uh, among the Jewish people, and I keep learning about that. And I, I think I can explain uh, just before we started this recording. Uh, we were talking, Nancy, about I went to visit a friend who was sitting Shiva. And uh, sitting Shiva is a seven day period when a close family member has uh, passed away. Mm -hmm. And they spend that seven days remembering that person. Now, this friend of mine, his father passed away. So, uh, you know, I was sitting down with him. He was sharing some pictures and stories about his father. Um, and it's a very rich uh, experience. I think it's quite healthy too, uh, as they they reflect and uh, remember somebody so close to them. I think sometimes in the United States we we do funerals or wakes very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. but they take time, and I think it's very healthy for their souls. One other thing I would share, Nancy, is Shabbat. Shabbat is a uh, a central part of the Jewish life here and in, in the life of Israel. Now, Shabbat begins on Friday afternoon, and it, the time varies uh, depending on the time of the year, uh, when it begins and when it ends. And typically, uh, people will go to their family, and they will uh, spend an evening meal together, they will pray together. And then from Friday sundown to, uh, you know, Saturday sundown, uh, some people, they don't get on the computers, they don't get on their cell phones, uh, they, they spend time praying or in the word or with the family. You know, if you drive around here on a, on a Saturday afternoon, Nancy, you would see many families just walking. Uh, and it's a wonderful family time of bonding, uh, time of being in, in God's word in the Hebrew scriptures and, mm -hmm. uh, and bonding with each other. Uh, that I would say is, um, uh, a really elemental part of the Jewish life here. I'd mm -hmm. also say that uh, another thing that is bond in people in Israel is the IDF, is that it's compulsory that all men and women serve, uh, you know, two and a half to one and a half years, if you're a male mm -hmm. or female. Um, and that really is a bonding time. Now here during the war, it's more than ever. And I think this has been a, um, a people forged in the fire of affliction after mm. October 7. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, people have described it, and I think it's so true. Israel's less of a nation than it is a family uh, or less of a country than it is a family. Uh, mm. When somebody is murdered, somebody is taken hostage, everybody feels it. Uh, and I think in particular now during this war, uh, many people are, um, especially parents, mm -hmm. are, are going through such an anguish of the soul because very often a son or a daughter are in, in uh, harm's way. They're up in the north in Lebanon, they're down south in Gaza or serving in some other capacity. Um, so all of that is, is unique to this time. But mm -hmm. I would say that um, the Jewish people, uh, the, you know, the more I learn about the Jewish people, the more I uh, have an admiration of what they, what they go through, uh, their history and their rich, um, rich uh, heritage. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what, too? I, I recall, um, you know, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson saying that a lot of them have PTSD yeah. from this war right now and they're suffering. Um, do you see, do you think that they're any closer to getting the rest of the hostages or do you, I mean, do you know anything about that? You know, I, I, um, I, I was talking to a friend of mine who is a Christian counselor. She was uh, talking to uh, a friend of hers that was getting out of the army and that was going to take, I think, uh, this man and maybe her family to dinner. And I, I said, well, does, does he have PTSD? She says, we all have PTSD. Uh, mm. You know, especially the um, 
the men and women serving on the front lines. Uh, it's a grueling experience, especially those in combat, uh, literally on the front lines. So um, it's very important right now, a, a time to pray for God to comfort uh, the people of Israel and uh, get them through this time. And uh, CBN Israel, a part of what we do here, uh, it's not part of CBN News, but there's a CBN Israel that provides trauma counseling, and yeah. I know many other organizations do as well. In terms of the hostages, uh, it, it's so frustrating, uh, mm -hmm. but beyond frustrating, it's, it's so agonizing for the people of Israel and the Jewish people worldwide that so many of these hostages still remain in captivity. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe, I think, as is of our recording, about 101 that are still mm -hmm. in captivity, but they don't know exactly how many are still alive. Maybe as maybe a half or less than half are still alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's very agonizing. We did a story at the very beginning of the war, Nancy, and it, um, a rabbi told us that a, a family or a loved one that has a, somebody in a, as a hostage, it's worse than a death. And uh, mm. it's, it's very, it's such an anguish because there's no closure and you mm -hmm. don't know what's happening to them. Uh, you know, there's been horrific reports of the women being raped uh, or abused in, in, in different ways. Uh, the men being <clears throat> abused as well, or, you know, deprivation of sleep or, or food. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it, that has been probably the most agonizing uh, time or <clears throat> for the is Jewish people uh, since mm -hmm. October 7th. Yeah, you know, my heart's breaking. I'm, I'm tearing up over here hearing you talking mm -hmm. about that. I, you know, I saw an interview with a, a woman over there who was a, who was taken captive, and she was like the light in a dark place. I don't can't recall her name, but she's been out speaking, and she really she has been. She talked about how she actually made friends with the people in that in like uh, the uh, the terrorists that were holding them. The, I don't know if it was Hamas or who, yeah. but anyway, long story short, she was um, trying to uphold the other hostages that were there. And it was just a heartbreaking story. And after I heard that, I said, does even, does even anybody know what they're going through over there? Does anybody even recall this? And just hearing you talking about it, I think people really want to know. What is the truth that's happening over there to these people, these these poor people that are going through something that they don't deserve at yeah, all? Right. You know? Yeah. And it's been heart wrenching to see the um, to visit the kibbutzim on the uh, Gaza border. And we were there in kibbutz Be'eri about a week after October 7th and then other kibbutzim, uh, different places. One is Kafar Aza, where there was a a place where many of the young people in the kibbutz lived and almost everybody in that uh, one small section in the kibbutz was either murdered or taken hostage. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was, if you ever visit here, the, uh, the kibbutzim on the border was really an idyllic life. They were pretty, they were beautiful places, a strong sense of community where people lived nearby each other, where family members could be, you know, next door or just a few feet away. So a grandfather could get his grandson or granddaughter, you know, running over on a, a Shabbat morning. And that all just changed on October 7th, uh, just such, mm -hmm. such a horrific way. Mm, I'm so yeah. sad about that. Well, you know, there is um, so much biblical history tied to the Middle East. How has God? How has God shown you His promises and deepened your understanding of them? Wow. Well, one thing I think about is you know after being here since two thousand, is that you can see um, the prophecy unfolding uh, in such a uh, wonderful. Uh, sweet way. I mean, the main thing you can see from that is the uh, Jewish people returning uh, from the four corners of the earth, just like Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and many of the other prophets said would happen, and it's happening. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is Zechariah talked about, um, you know, the nations of the world coming against Jerusalem, and we see that increasingly true. That mm -hmm. happens. I also think we see, and I, I, it really accelerated after October 7th, but there is a, a such a strong bond between Christians who believe that God has his hand on Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, they call them Christian Zionists. Uh, and the closeness of the Jewish people, uh, we see um, that bond growing closer and closer. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's, um, it's really wonderful to see. I, I you know, I, I get to be to both to um, sort of be part of it, but also report on it. Uh, you know, when I go to over and visit my friend and sitting Shiva, uh, it's just a, a one way of just expressing uh, you know, God's love uh, mm -hmm. to them in their hour of need, whether it's a personal uh, mourning or it's a, uh, a nationwide mourning from October 7th. And also as they go through this uh, dark night of the soul, not only mm -hmm. with the hostages, but being surrounded by enemies that want to destroy them. And so we have that privilege of being able to report on what's happening. And one thing, Nancy, and it happened at the Shiva, we met some people that say, we watch you, we watch you, uh, we record you. And on Sunday mornings, we, we watch you and we appreciate the way you report the news. And uh, yes. that, that to us is really very encouraging and heartwarming. Oh, yes, you have a big fan base here in the United States as well. Seriously? <laughs> oh, yeah. So let me let me tell you, let me ask you this question then. You know, um, you have this wonderful love of Israel. Yeah. But you started out where? You started what 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 state were you from? Were you did you always go to church? Did you come to the Lord in a in a, a miraculous way? <laughs> Could you just bless my audience. Okay, well I'll tell them. Well, so uh I grew up around uh right around Boston. I grew up I grew up in an Irish Roman Catholic family place called Lynn Mass, which is a little 15 miles north of Boston. So I grew up Catholic. Um, and when I was 16, and this is sort of my testimony uh, in abbreviated fashion, it started at Dunkin Donuts and it ended at McDonald's. So, <laughs> so when I was 16, my, my, my sister Jean and I, we left, uh, she must have had the car. When I think back of it, she must have had the car at the time. She was about 18, and we skipped Mass. Now, back at when I was 16, that was a big deal. Uh, you didn't want to skip Mass, but we did. And we went to Dunkin' Donuts. And uh, I'm sure I was there ordering a sugar crawler and, uh, or a Boston cream uh, donut. And I just knew something kind of flipped in my heart uh, that I, uh, it kind of separated me from the church. Partly because I was, I was feeling, uh, I wasn't feeling as I was in the pews, a connection w was happening on the altar, and I was sort of searching. So that really accelerated that search. Eight years later, on May 8, 1977, after an eight-year period of, you know, searching and questioning and wondering, you know, some of those big life questions: Who am I? Where am I going? what happens after life, you know, after you die, and uh, big questions I needed to answer. So I had an uncle during those eight years who was very, very close to me. He was sort of like a father figure. And I asked him, George, why, what makes you so different? Why are you so uh, happy, joyful? And he said it was his relationship with Christ. And that drew me, but during those formative late teens, early 20s, there was, I didn't want to necessarily um, commit if you want to, you know, there were things in the world that I didn't want to give up. So, but I became desperate. And so well, I moved down to Washington, D.C. to uh, work on actually the President Ford campaign at the time, uh, because my cousin was working for him and it was just something to do. Uh, I just, you know, something to do then, uh, that, so I went down there and uh, President Ford lost and my uncle George said, I was gonna move back to Boston. He says, why don't you just stay and uh, you know, you're a young guy, you know? And so I did, I stayed 
and uh, he introduced me to a pastor. We had a conversation on Capitol Hill uh, in Washington, D.C., and then he introduced me to another guy. He says, why don't you meet with this guy, Dennis Bankston? May 8, 1977, we're at McDonald's, and I spent two hours over French fries, a vanilla shake, and a filet fish sandwich asking about <laughs> what it meant to be born again, what it mm -hmm. meant to be, invite Jesus in your heart. Mm -hmm. And this was sort of like a foreign language as a, you know, as a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so after two hours, we left. He went his way. I went mine. And what was on the intercom was music from a well-known popular rock opera at the time, Jesus Christ Superstar. And it meant something to me. So, but I was living on Capitol Hill on D Street with some friends of mine. And I walked from that McDonald's to D Street. And on that time, my heart changed. And I knew that Jesus came in my heart. And by the time I left McDonald's, I got to D Street, something had changed in my heart. And I felt like Jesus came in my heart. So for the first time in eight years, I wanted to go to church. I went with Dennis that first time. Uh, later on, and a few months later, I met my wife. We got engaged. We've been married now 46 years. And, uh, but that was the epiphany. Thank you. But that was the epiphany that changed my life. Um, and some people say, you know, it's like a sacred time, sacred uh, place. And that walk was a change in my life. And I knew Jesus came in my heart. He became a person. He became real. And... And thankfully, all the, you know, I went to Catholic school and Catholic church. All the teachings that I had during that time, uh, the Bible came alive. I remember mm -hmm. my first Christmas and I thought, this is what it's all about. So this is what Christmas is all about. You know, he came for us. Uh, mm -hmm. So all the scripture that I had been taught those many years came alive. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I appreciate my Catholic upbringing, my, what my mother and father did for me, they sent me to Catholic school. I was mm -hmm. an altar boy and a choir boy, but somehow the penny didn't drop for me until mm -hmm. that day, May 8, 1977. I, I love your story. I love your story. Um, also, I was brought up a Catholic, so I understand where you were, you're coming from in that. And yeah. there is, they, they do walk strongly in their faith. So, um, so that it was wonderful. I'm, I'm glad yeah. you, you, you shared that. Yeah. And I, I, you know, it, it just this, uh, this Catholic boy at that time, I, I just was kind of lost. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, like I said, there's many, many Catholics that are wonderful Bible believing Jesus loving people, but somehow I didn't kind of that spiritual penny didn't drop for me during those times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow, wow. Well, you know, after all these years in Jerusalem, what's the biggest spiritual lesson God has taught you about trusting him? That's my last question. I say, just say yes. If God asks you to do something, just say yes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's so simple. I, I came here because I said yes. Um, I was asked to come. I mean, it was like CBN that said, you know, do you want to start a bureau? Uh, but I knew it was deeper than that. It was like God's calling. And I just, I just wanted to be obedient and just say yes. And I recently heard something, I think, for RJ, R. R. Kendall, getting his uh, abbreviations right. And he was asked that question, something to the effect that you've got a lot of degrees. What's, what's the message you would say? And I remember this so vividly. He said, um, he said two things. He said, pray a lot and know your Bible. And I think that's such a simple but profound uh, way. And, uh, and, and also to say yes to Holy Spirit and to draw close to him. I, I think that's the most important thing. Just what's God saying to you right now? And just keep following that still small voice. And because uh, God has a plan for everybody. He had a plan for me. He happened to wanted me over here in Jerusalem uh, for such a time as this. You know, and it's a privilege. It's a responsibility. It's, it's a calling. But God has a call for everybody. And one day we're all going to see him face to face. And I want to run my race in such a way that when I see him face to face, he'll say, 
well done, good, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And to me, that is the most important thing. That's our finish line. And, uh, mm-hmm. and if we can say yes, pray a lot, know our Bible, follow Holy Spirit, then, uh, then I think we'll hear those, those two, two words, well done. That's wonderful. Well, now, what would you like to leave my audience with today? Even though you said that wonderful bunch of words that we just heard, <laughs> what would you like to leave them with? Can I pray for them? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Father, I just thank you for everyone listening. And uh, thank you that they follow uh, Nancy's teachings and uh, support her. Lord, I pray for each and every one listening right now. You have a calling on each of one of their lives. Lord, we all face challenges. We all face obstacles. We all have issues uh, in our own life or in our families. Um, As my brother says, as a family, we keep the fun and dysfunctional. We're all kind of a work in progress. But Father, I pray that for the grace of the Lord to be upon each and every one listening, the, the presence of Holy Spirit to be upon them, to give them joy, to give them grace, to give them encouragement, to give them favor, Lord, in all the things that they face, whether they're relational or financial or medical or physical. Father, we pray for physical healing, that you touch bodies and heal hearts. And Father, for those wounded in their souls, that you would encourage them and give them grace and comfort uh, as they as they go through life. Lord, we pray for strength and, Lord, that we listen to you, Holy Spirit, uh, to, as, as we go through life. So wherever we are in our, on our stages of life, whether we're close to the end or very at the very beginning, that we would have the grace and the faith to continue till we cross the finish line. The finish line is when we meet you face to face. You take us home or you're coming back here. So I pray for that blessing upon each and every one listening in Nancy's audience as they listen to this. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nancy. This has been great. Thank you. (laughs) Yes. Until next time, all glory and honor to King Jesus.